Did you know that there's an activity that can improve your productivity, increase your lifespan, improve your memory, and even strengthen your resolve or your willpower? And that is sleep. So in this relatively short video, I'm going to attempt to equip you with the essentials on sleep. And this starts with how sleep works and some of the main myths around sleep. And finally, we move on to some of the optimizations that you can implement to get a good night's sleep on a regular basis and increase the overall quality of your sleep. The content in this video is based primarily on the books Why We Sleep by Dr. Matthew Walker and Sleep Smarter by Sean Stevenson. So feel free to check out those books and I'll leave the links down in the description if you're interested. As I alluded to earlier, sleep is extremely important when it comes to your overall well-being both from a mental health perspective and a physical health perspective. And sleep is often thought of as one of the three main pillars in your overall health, the other two being diet and exercise. Out of the three though, sleep is often the one that's most neglected. And seeing as we spent roughly a third of our life sleeping, it's worth building up the tools and the knowledge in order to be able to get a good night's sleep on a regular basis. So hopefully by the end of this video, that's exactly what you'll have. So starting with how exactly sleep works, you may have heard of the term the circadian rhythm. And all this is, is your internal body clock or timer that tells you when you should feel awake and when you should feel sleepy and go to bed. The circadian rhythm is generated in part of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus and is one of the main things responsible for regulating the quality and time of your sleep. But what you might not know is that we're not all wired the same way in terms of our circadian rhythm. And one of the big differentiators is what's called your chronotype. The chronotype is best thought of as your genetic predisposition for sleeping over a certain window. And this could either be in the earlier parts, so you could be an early bird where you go to bed early and wake up early, or you could be a night owl, so you go to bed late and get up later, or you could be somewhere in between. And roughly 40% of people are early birds, 30% are night owls and the remaining 30% is in between. What this means is that if you're someone who struggles to get up early on a regular basis, even though in theory you got adequate sleep, it could be because you have a later chronotype. So in terms of sleep itself and how it actually works, you may have heard of the chemical of melatonin and people often associate this with being the primary chemical responsible for sleeping well, as it's often found in sleeping pills. And while melatonin definitely serves an important purpose, it's not the be all and end all, and it's often best thought of as a sort of a drill sergeant that tells the people in the military camp to turn off the lights and go to bed, but it doesn't actually enforce it. So there's no guarantee that by taking melatonin or having adequate supplies of melatonin naturally, that you're gonna get a good night's sleep. Instead, there's another chemical that is as important or possibly more important in determining your levels of sleepiness and how you go to sleep, and that is adenosine. Over the course of the day when you're awake, your body accumulates adenosine, and it's this particular chemical that makes you actually feel sleepy and signal to you that you should go to bed because your body is actually trying to decrease or lower your overall levels of adenosine, and this happens while sleeping. So in a way, if you think of this process like a tap that's on when you're awake, and over the course of the day, the sink is filling up, but when you go to sleep, it's like you've pulled out the plug and you allow the water to drain. Using this analogy, when that water level reaches a certain point, it signals to your brain that it's time to sleep because you need to decrease that water level so that you can function again effectively the next day. And this brings me on to the whole topic of caffeine, which is often found in teas, coffees, and energy drinks. And how caffeine actually works is by blocking the adenosine receptors. So even though that you have an adequate supply of adenosine, which would normally trigger you to feel sleepy, instead, because they're blocked, the adenosine isn't able to get through and trigger the particular pathways that are normally responsible for you actually feeling sleepy. I'm gonna talk about caffeine more in a little while, but I wanna first move on to the whole idea of the sleep cycle. So let's say on a given night you slept for seven and a half hours, and to you it feels like it's one continuous block, but in reality, it's actually broken down to 90 minute segments where each segment is a sleep cycle. The consequence of all this is when you understand the sleep cycle, it shows you that both the quantity and the quality of your sleep is important because you need to get enough full sleep cycles, but also you can't just gloss over them. You actually have to reach the full extent of what each cycle actually gives you and offers. So roughly speaking, each sleep cycle is broken down into two different categories where the first one is non-REM sleep and the second is REM sleep, where REM stands for rapid eye movement. 
So when you start your sleep, you typically begin with the lighter stages of non-REM sleep, and these are labeled stage one and stage two non-REM sleep. After a certain time, you then move into deep non-REM sleep. And if you're able to scan your brain during this time, you will see that your brain activity tends to slow down a lot and the overall brain waves are a lot more spaced out and a lot more slow relative to the other stages of sleep and especially wakefulness. Once you come out of deep non-REM sleep, then you move into a stage of the sleep cycle which is often called REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep because of the particular phenomena where your eyes flicker from side to side when you're going through it and this is often when dreaming occurs. Each stage of the sleep cycle is very important and serves a fundamental purpose what is interesting is each sleep cycle itself doesn't actually look the same as the next one because what often happens is in the earlier sleep cycles there's a larger portion of that particular cycle that is done through deep non-REM sleep but as you get towards the latter stages of the night then you actually have a larger portion of REM sleep. What this means practically is let's say your normal sleeping window is from 11pm to 7am and on a given night you went to bed late at say 2am even though you might get less sleep cycles, and that is a problem in itself, the main thing is that you actually missed the window where deep non-REM sleep was particularly emphasized. So you might get an adequate supply of REM sleep, but the deeper stages of non-REM sleep are the thing that you mostly miss out on. So just quickly in terms of the functions of each stage of the sleep cycle, deep non-REM sleep is often thought of as restorative sleep, as it kind of detoxes and cleanses both your body and your mind. So it might remove memories that no longer are important and help you regulate the events of that particular day. But then when you move to REM sleep, it's the thing that ties everything together. It allows you to process your emotions and to make sense of all of the pieces of information that you found and to kind of form a bigger picture overall so things are more clear the next day. That's why dreaming often occurs in REM sleep because you're trying to stitch together a bunch of different memories and make sense of them collectively in an abstract way. So now I want to move on to three of the biggest myths when it comes to sleep and the first one is related to alcohol and this is when people often say that alcohol or a certain alcoholic drink can help them sleep. Now it is true that alcohol has a sedative effect so it can indeed help you fall asleep initially but usually this is at the cost of the quality of your sleep and it's important to remember that sedation is not sleep. If you want proof of this then look at two particular examples the first being even though you might have got 8, 9, 10 hours sleep after a night of drinking, you often don't feel energized or restored. A second example to show that sedation is not sleep is that if you've ever had to have surgery and be put to sleep via general anesthetic, then you might realize that even though you wake up feeling like that you've slept, the reality is you feel very sleepy and groggy when you do wake up. There are two main reasons why alcohol reduces the overall quality of your sleep. And the first is that it staggers your sleep. So you're more prone to wake up during the night rather than getting one continuous block of sleep over that night. The second reason is because it can actually lower the amount of REM sleep you get. So even though you may have actually stayed asleep over the course of the entire night, because REM sleep is related to memory consolidation and having a reduction in REM sleep means that when you wake up, you may not have fully processed the events that took place the night before. So things are a little bit blurry. The last thing about alcohol is it can increase snoring and sleep apnea and this in turn can decrease the overall quality of your sleep so it's another thing to keep in mind. The next myth is when people say that they can drink coffee or caffeine late at night before bed and it doesn't really affect them. The thing to realize about caffeine is that it has a half-life of roughly six hours. So what this means is that if you drink a cup of coffee at 6 p.m then by midnight you will still have the equivalent of half a cup of coffee still in your system. There is some variation to this, but mostly it's because some people have genetic predispositions which makes it more easy for them to tolerate and metabolize caffeine. But again, like the last example, even if someone is actually capable of falling asleep after a cup of coffee right before bed, then it doesn't mean that they're getting the same levels of quality of sleep that they would have otherwise. The thing about caffeine is that it can actually reduce the overall amount of deep non-REM sleep that you get over a given night. So again, even if you get eight hours of sleep under the influence of caffeine, you might actually miss out on some of that quality. 
And the last myth is when someone says that they sleep only four to five hours per night but feel totally fine the next day. What has often happened here is that they've actually forgotten what a good night's sleep feels like and their sleep deprived state on a daily basis actually has become their default. As a general rule of thumb, you should always aim for a minimum six hours sleep, but seven to nine is optimal. But I think it's also important to point out that our bodies are very capable of dealing with short-term stresses, and this can actually include having a bad night's sleep on a given night or waking up early for a given reason. And it's the long-term struggle or the long-term effects of sleep deprivation that's the problem and the thing that you should try and avoid. So I think the takeaway is not to feel bad if you get a bad night's sleep on the odd occasion, as this is perfectly normal. It's only a problem when this becomes the default state and happens every night. So now we're gonna move on to the final section, which is what are some of the practical and actionable steps that you can do to increase the overall quality and quantity of your sleep? The first one is sunlight. And as we mentioned earlier, the circadian rhythm, which is responsible for telling you when to go to sleep and when to wake up, is often reset and regulated by sunlight. So just by getting an adequate amount of sunlight, ideally on your skin in the earlier stages of the day, it can help reset your circadian rhythm so that your body knows then when to make you feel sleepy later in the day. The next one is exercise, and this is for two reasons. One, because when you exercise, it increases the overall metabolic activity in your body. Therefore, it's likely to increase your overall supply of adenosine, which will make you feel sleepy later on in the day. And the second reason is just as important, possibly more important, and that is exercise is one of the best strategies that you can employ to reduce your overall levels of stress. I think we've all had those moments where we've been kept up at night because we're worrying about something the following day, and this could be a competition, an exam, or a driving test, and it's this particular stress that prevents us from having a good night's sleep. So if we're able to remove or reduce that stress, then the problem will likely go away. From my experience, the people who struggle the most with their sleep is due to some underlying and chronic stressor that they're unable to deal with or haven't dealt with. So finding a good outlet for your stress is definitely one of the best things that you can do to improve the quality of your sleep. And this could be by seeking some kind of therapist or positive environment or to channel it through exercise. And the next one is diet. And over the next few weeks, I'm gonna be making the equivalent of this video, but rather about sleep. It's gonna be all about exercise. So if you're interested, keep an eye out for that or even subscribe so you're able to get notified. But for now, it's not just eating the right kinds of foods, and that's very important, but also it's eating at the right time. Eating the right kinds of foods can be very beneficial for your sleep because it can reduce your overall levels of inflammation. It can also prevent you from getting a crazy or erratic blood glucose spike. And finally, some foods are even conducive to having a good night's sleep. The next optimization is temperature. And as you get towards the point in the day where you're getting sleepy, your body is trying to lower its overall temperature. So if you're in a very warm environment, it can kind of conflict with your ability to fall asleep effectively. So what generally is the case is that at nighttime, it's better to sleep in a cooler room. It's also the reason why having a hot bath or shower not too long before sleep can actually be a good thing because what happens is the overall rise in body temperature that you get from having that hot bath or shower is immediately followed by a rapid drop in body temperature and that drop is also conducive to the temperature required for sleeping. And the final optimization that I'm gonna mention is darkness. And when it comes to sleep, the darker the room, the better. But even in the minutes and hours building up to the sleep, then it's also good to lower the overall levels of light and be in a dim environment. Out of all the wavelengths of light, it's actually blue light that's the most harmful towards your sleep. And this is presumably because it's reminiscent of the daytime. So when your brain or eyes perceive blue light, it thinks it's the daytime and therefore you should be awake. What this means is that all screens, particularly phones, emit a lot of blue light. So if you're able to avoid or reduce the amount of light you get prior to bed, then it can definitely increase the overall quality of your sleep. And as a compromise, you can even get blue light filtering glasses or put your phone on a particular mode that the screen looks orange, but actually it's just filtering out the blue light. But seeing as blue light energizes your brain, it's best as much as possible to avoid those kind of devices altogether. So that's it for this one. I hope you enjoyed. If you got something out of it, then feel free to like, subscribe, or leave a comment down below. 
Otherwise, I will see you in the next video.